I, I have been asked to talk about the problem of miracles, which is, um, are miracles possible? Can God act in nature? And can you know about it? Okay? And I was particularly prompted in regard to the, the work of David Hume, so I'll give you a quick outline. My intention is to go somewhat fast so we can get to questions at the end, all right? So you'll hear the word miracle applied to all kinds of stuff, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll try to do a little better in terms of defining what a miracle is. Some people will use the word miracle in a very loose way. They're like, every flower is a miracle. Every baby is a miracle. And if you hang around baseball people, like baseball people really believe in miracles. And they say, we all roar our hats sideways and a miracle occurred, you know, that sort of thing. But mainly what we're talking about tonight is the, the good old-fashioned biblical miracle like parting the Red Sea, a person rising from the dead, fire being called down from heaven, things like that, that, that everyone would agree, yes, that counts as a miracle, okay? Um, I'll mainly talk initially about the work of famous Scottish philosopher David Hume. Um, the reason we're going to focus so much on him is there's a little bit of shorthand in the, in the broader culture now. People will say like, oh, miracles, David Hume dealt with that in the 1700s, who cares? Acting as if he kind of settled the matter, matter. So we'll go through uh, Hume's work a little bit, both on, on miracles, and then talk about the broader scientific enlightenment and how that relates to miracles. A quick informal poll of the audience tonight kind of said that this number two may be the biggest issue that you face. And then we'll also talk about how Hume, uh, his view of, of whether you could believe a witness to a miracle, and also this problem of, of multiple conflicting religions all, all claiming miracles as well, and how can we, how can we deal with that. Um, my prompt for a lot of this was this book by, uh, let's see if it goes, come on now, there we go, I've got it right here, this book, uh, Hume's Abject Failure, um, there's an old, say this is by John Ehrman, he's a philosopher, and there's an old saying that for every equation you put in your book, the sales drop by, by 50%, um, anyway, this book definitely has that problem, um, this is for philosophers written, and, and, and so I would, it's definitely a, a little bit of a, a, a deep dive, so I'll recommend some others to you in a, mo a moment. I will say a bizarre coincidence. You can see, uh, I hope you can see this painting that's on the front of the book. Um, Y'all can tell this is actually Lazarus being raised. And just a few weeks after I saw, after I started reading the book, I went to the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, and you can actually see this exact painting, if I can get it to come up. Is it coming? No. There it is. <laughs> So this exact painting is in the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth. Um, this is uh, from, <clears throat> let's see, the, from the early 1300s. So this is almost kind of pre-Renaissance. I particularly enjoy this one guy who's, who's, who they, the artist chose to include holding his nose saying, but Lord, he stinketh, right? And so that's in the King James, by the way, he stinketh. Um, if you want a more accessible uh, uh, description of the same topic, um, just a few weeks ago, I got this new book from Ian Hutchinson. Uh, he's a plasma physicist at MIT called Can a Scientist Believe in Miracles? This would be perfectly appropriate for any college student. It's really good. I'd re definitely recommend it. And of course, the classic uh, uh, take on miracles comes from C.S. Lewis and his book, Miracles. So I would recommend those to you as well. Those are my major sources for what we're going to go through tonight. So let's go ahead and talk about Hume and miracles. <clears throat> so... Uh, uh, I'll start you off with common categories that we use to distinguish miracles. Um, generally, we say there's natural causes. So if there's rain or if there's no rain, if there's a famine, we would say like, well, these things happen, right? But you can imagine a scenario, and this actually happens in the story of Elijah, where Elijah prays for rain and rain happens, right? The same day he prays for it. Now, we, we don't generally say that was necessarily a miracle because we, it could be just a coincidence or it could be that God kind of arranged things to, to time exactly right where the day, that Elijah, the, the, the day that Elijah prays for rain, rain comes. And so people will often term this as special providence. Um, a lot of healing claims could potentially be filed under this, this category. We prayed for this person to be healed and sure enough, they recovered from their disease, right? But then there are the straight up miracles like Elijah calling down fire from heaven. Like there's really not a way to, to, to come up with some way to ascribe uh, uh, that incident to, to natural causes. What you'll see in the, in the literature, by the way, is that people are often much more allergic to this last category and they'll go to great lengths to try to think of natural ways that biblical miracles could be accounted for and, 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 and you'll see why as we go along. Okay, so I think a helpful, at least starting definition, is that a miracle lies outside the productive capacity of the natural world. God needs to be involved. Some supernatural force needs to be involved in some way, okay? So here's what Hume says, and this is try number one. I'll go ahead and tell you this is not going to go super well. Uh, Hume says, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature, and his firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, 
The proof against a miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. There, there must, therefore, be a uniform experience against every miraculous event. Otherwise, the event would not merit that appellation. Right? So he's basically saying, like, there's uniform experience against miracles. Miracles never happen. Therefore, miracles never happen. That was easy. Right? And so, so people have frequently criticized Hume and his silly hat, uh, as you see in this picture, for, for basically kind of uh, assuming his conclusion. He says, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. The laws of nature are never violated. Therefore, miracles never happen. Okay? So I don't think this is as laughable as his hat because the reality is that, that if you believe in miracles, you may even now be a little bit at war with yourself over which one of those two premises to disagree with. You could say, like, well, maybe a miracle is not really a violation of the laws of nature. Maybe not. Maybe it's not that one. Hold on, my mouse is betraying me again. Hold on, guys. There we go. So it could be that one, or it could be the other one. You also might deny that the laws of nature are never violated. It kind of depends on how you define what a miracle is and what, how you define the laws of nature. We'll get into that in a moment. But you should take this seriously. If you want to get away from Hume's argument here, you'd have to figure out which one of these two premises you don't believe in. Okay? Uh, so... Hume then tries it again. He says, sorry, let's try again, try again. Okay, nothing is esteemed a miracle if it ever happens in the common course of nature. It is no miracle that a man, seemingly in good health, should die on a sudden because such a, such a kind of death, though more unusual than any other, has yet been frequently observed to happen. But it is a miracle that a dead man should come to life because that has never been observed in any age or country. So here he's not so much saying miracles by definition can't happen. He's talking about probability. He's using words like frequency. How much have we observed this versus that? Effectively, he's making a scoreboard argument of saying, look, over the whole course of human history, death is up on life, you know, 8 billion to zero. Right? Not 8 billion to 1, but 8 billion to 0. So if you tell me that, we, that, that the other side just scored a point, like I'm going to have a hard time believe, believing you just because of the numbers. Death is not up 49 to 0. Death is up much higher than that. Right? There's a line in the movie The Princess Bride, <coughs> which is a movie you should all see if you haven't already, um, where the, uh, our hero and heroine are going into this horrible fire swamp, this swamp with all kinds of dangers, and uh, uh, the, the girl says, we'll never survive. And uh, uh, her, her, her lover says, nonsense, you're only saying that because no one ever has. And it's funny because it's like, oh, this is a good reason to believe that we're not going to make it out of here alive. So Hume is basically saying the same thing, that if you just look at the numbers, you've got to conclude that it's not, it's not going to happen. Okay, so let's see if we can make a little bit better sense of this. He's saying, uh, Uniform experience says the numbers are against any kind of miracle, any kind of deviation from what normally happens. So <clears throat> Hume says, we learn from experience, not from definition, but from experience, that all A's are B's, right? All humans are mortal. And that no A's are non-B's, no humans are non-mortal. Therefore, we form a presumptive law of nature that all A's are B's. Now, this is somewhat strange, given that in his other writings, David Hume is actually like, uh, he's very skeptical of induction. But here he's like, induction is good. I gather lots of data, and then from that data, I form a presumptive law of nature. So now we can try the argument again. He says, a miracle is a violation of a presumptive law of nature. And experience tells you that the chances of that law of nature continuing are really high, really, really high, like so close to one that you may as well just say it's one. And the chances of that law of nature not being held are so close to zero that you may as well just call it zero. So it's not a definitive proof because it's not really one and zero, but it's really close. So that's Hume's argument. This has also been found somewhat wanting along the way, right? So he would say, like, if, if we set up a billiard shot, billiards is like a boring version of pool. It's the same basic idea, right? If we set up the shot and I hit the cue ball with the same force, it will go exactly the same way and do the same thing every single time. And if it does it every single time over many, many, many experiments, eventually we say, look, the probability that the next one's going to go the same way approaches one. There are some difficulties with this which is it doesn't seem to leave room for new experiences. Um, I grew up watching a lot of The Muppets, and I always remember this one where uh, Dr. Bunsen Honeydew, he's the friend of Beaker. Everybody knows Beaker, I think, yes? Okay, good. I'm glad you all know that. Anyway, he, he invents a gorilla detector, and he's like, the gorilla detector works, there's no doubt. And then as he's being killed by a gorilla, he expresses his confidence. He says, I am scientifically certain that I am not being killed by a gorilla, like as he's being killed by, the, by a gorilla. So the problem is, once you've formed this presumptive law of nature, it's very weird to say, now we have the law of nature, and if any new data comes in that conflicts with this, I'm going to exclude that data. 
I'm going to exclude that new experience. That seems unscientific, right? It seems like a problem. In fact, um, this was known even in Hume's time. John Locke told, the, told this famous story, and uh, uh, you'll notice in this little passage that this is the old-timey, I'm going to write some S's, but not all of them, as if they're F's. And so we can, anyway, I'll see if I can actually read this thing. Locke says, as it happened to a Dutch ambassador, who, entertaining the king of Siam with the particulars of Holland, which he was inquisitive after, amongst other things, told him that the water in his country would, some, would sometimes, in cold weather, be so hard that men walked upon it and it would bear an elephant. Right? So why does the king of Siam not believe this? He's never, if you, if you live in Siam, you're never, you've never seen ice. So the king says, uh, hitherto I believe the strange things you've told me. Because I to look upon you as a fober fair man, but now I am sure you lie. Right? And so this tells you that, like, the king of Siam is actually operating according to Hume's maxim. Saying, like, hey, all my experience says water is never solid, so you must be lying. But we know the king of Siam is wrong. So what would Hume say to this? Hume would say, like, well... Pfft, the king is only taking like, his own experience into account or his country's experience into account. He's not taking all of humanity's experience into account. It's still a little bogus because you can imagine a scenario where like, all of humanity lives in the tropics and then they really would form a law that water is never solid. And they'd be wrong. So a scientist would say, well, the reason the king of Siam is wrong is not that <clears throat> he, you know, he's not, he doesn't really have all human experience and like humans are limited, right, Einstein, right? Like Einstein, literally Einstein says like, hey man, if you start going close to the speed of light, weird things happen that is against all human experience. And Einstein's right, see what I'm saying? And the scientists would say like, the king is wrong because there's this other factor, which is temperature, which he hasn't really varied enough before. Einstein is right because there's this other factor of speed getting close to the speed of light that you've never varied before. So if there's a departure from the established presumptive laws of nature, there's going to be a good reason for it. And that's how you open yourself up to new experience. Okay? So this is actually where we can get into the view that probably all of y'all have heard about miracles and why they can't happen, why they're unscientific. And this happens not just within, Hume, within Hume's framework, but the broader scientific enlightenment. Okay? So I think I can explain it this way. Um, if you ever had the misfortune of taking Latin, which I did, you'll know that Latin was not just, you know, spoken by ancient Romans a long time ago, but it was actually used all throughout. It actually kind of uh, made it possible for mathematicians and scientists to speak to each other. And the biggest like treatise in Latin is the Principia, right? Isaac Newton writes about his laws of motion. And it really makes a big impact on the continent of Europe because people are like, oh man, Newtonian physics. With Newtonian physics, I can tell you what the planets are going to do. I can tell you what a baseball is going to do. I can tell you what a rocket's going to do. There's all kinds of great stuff you can do with just a basic physics class. It's great. It's great. In fact, it's so great, people are so excited about this, that they said, um, you know what? We can predict everything with this. And the idea was that the world is a clock. The world is a clock. It all operates according to, um, to predictable, predictable equations, and you know exactly what it's going to do. So, th so they would call it la machine du monde, right? The, 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 the machine of the world. And there's this famous conversation that was recorded in the early 1800s between Napoleon and Laplace. Uh, Napoleon's reading all this work from Laplace, and he's like, oh, very impressive Laplace. I've heard of Laplace. He's a famous mathematician and physicist. And uh, Napoleon says, uh, you know, I don't see in any of your work here. There's, there's nothing here about God. And Laplace says, uh, je n'ai pas un besoin de cette hypothesis. Right in French, right. But what he's saying is, I have no need of that hypothesis. And usually people now read that as him saying he was an atheist. I don't have any need for this God hypothesis. But what he was actually saying is, maybe there's a God, but we, because we have these equations, we can predict how everything's going to happen. Maybe God wound the clock, but now he just lets it go. The world is like a big clock, and I know exactly how the gears are going to turn and how everything's going to work. And I think you all know, what is this view that God starts off the clock and then leaves it alone. What's it called? Deism. deism. Deism, that is right. And so the Enlightenment view was not straight up atheism, but it was deism. And there was a certain degree of not just like yay science, but also like it would be rude for God to like poke his finger into the clock after having started it, because that would actually inhibit our ability to use the equations to predict how everything's going to go. So they thought it's actually more beautiful and more elegant for the world to work this way. Does that make sense? So this is like the standard Enlightenment view, okay? 
Um, a year ago, uh, I had the pleasure of, of spending some quality time with Alan Lightman from MIT, and this is an example of the sort of thing he's written. He says, science and God are compatible as long as the latter is content to stand on the sidelines once the universe has begun. And this is pretty standard enlightenment deism. It says, maybe there's a God, maybe God got it all started or thought it all up, but once it's going, God needs to stay away because otherwise we can't do science. I can't do science because I can't take God tinkering with it because that messes up my equations. Yes? All right, so the scientific argument against miracles, and this is what you're most likely to hear um, from your classmates in the classroom. They would say natural forces cannot cause a dead person to be resurrected, right? Science says, like, dead, you're dead. Um, <clears throat> premise number two is that there are only natural forces in play. Deism says so, right? It says like the world's a machine, everything can be predicted, God doesn't stick his finger in after the fact. And so, so the conclusion is that a dead person cannot be resurrected. Okay, so that's, that's the conclusion. And of course, if you do believe in miracles, it's number two is the one that you're like, I don't know about that. And so I want to help you maybe frame miracles as something other than a violation of the laws of nature. I think as long as you phrase miracles are a violation of the laws of nature, it makes it really hard to have like good conversations with other people. So here's an illustration from C.S. Lewis that I think you'll find to be helpful. And I apologize. It looks like these slides got a little uh, monkeyed up as it went from one computer to another, but that's okay. So Hume take, uh, sorry, Lewis takes that same billiard ball example that we said earlier. So we're going to do the same, the same experiment. I have the cue ball, I have the eight ball, and I'm going to line up the shot and I hit, I'm going to hit it with a certain force, and I know, because I can use Newton's equations, I know exactly what's going to happen. I can predict it. It's going to work. Laws of nature say that the cue ball is going to go in, right? Everybody good? Okay. So here's, so I line it up. I've done the math. I know it's going to work. I know it's going to work, and I hit it, and then you reach in from outside the table and grab my cue ball. So here's the question. Did we violate a law of nature? No then why did my prediction not happen? I know y'all have done this. You've been forced to by your, your professors and your teachers. At some point, you had to draw this little dotted line around your system in your physics class. And you said, this is my system. I am assuming that nothing outside my system messes with my system. If that assumption is true, then I can use my equations and predict it, right? So in this case, the laws of nature were not violated, but my assumption that the dotted line was a boundary between my system and the rest of the world was not true because you reached in from outside the dotted line and messed with it. Do y'all see? Laws of nature weren't violated. An outside force, an outside force interacted with our system and that's why my equations got it wrong. That is what a miracle is. It is God reaching from outside the dotted line and changing something. So don't think of miracles as a violation of the law of nature. Think of it as God reaching in from outside and changing changing the assumptions that we, get, that, that we use to predict what's going to happen. That's the best way to think of it. And you can see all over the place that there is this enlightenment assumption floating around of deism that God's not allowed to do that. So, for instance, in this case, this guy says, he says, uh, modern cell biology has radically undermined the credibility of the virgin birth but it could, because it would require God's making a Y chromosome out of nothing in Mary's ovum. So you can see what he's saying. He's like, I can't think of any special providence way that God could do that. He'd have to like actually reach in and poof, create something out of nothing, and he's not allowed to do that. So this is not a convincing argument unless you buy that assumption. So this is the real issue. Why do people, why do so many people we interact with have that assumption? It's not that it's proven. It's that you have to, as a scientist, assume that God is not messing with your experiment in order to do science. And so if you say you believe in miracles, one of the natural responses is going to be like, if you believe in miracles, then how is science even possible? If I get a weird uh, 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 experimental result in the lab, then I could just blame it on God. I say, well, God messed with my experiment today. Don't know what to do with that data. It would make science impossible. So the answer is that when you say you believe in miracles, you don't believe that God like randomly says like, and your experiment's not working today. It is working tomorrow and the next day, but then again, next Monday, it's not working, right? That would be God capriciously messing with your experiment, and that would indeed make science impossible. So instead, we say miracles aren't random. Science can still be done, but miracles have a religious context. They don't happen randomly for no reason in some undetectable way that would make science impossible. Does this make sense? This is why, in fact, you can believe in miracles, which I do, and still be a scientist, which I am, right? We don't blame annoying data that doesn't fit what we want it to be on God and say a miracle happened there. So 
want you to take a look at these categories again. So I, I put this up and nobody questioned me. Nobody said this is wrong. These are the three categories I put up. Natural causes, special providence, and miracles. It may be we've actually made a mistake even in putting this up. I don't know if y'all can tell, but this is, by me putting these three categories up, I'm actually buying into enlightenment categories already, saying the world works on its own like a giant clock. And we're just arguing about whether God has the right to poke his finger in and change something along the way. But that enlightenment view is actually not biblical. The, the more conventional Christian view is that God is not outside the system, only occasionally reaching in and doing a miracle. The biblical view is that God is the sustainer of the universe, and it's by his will that the universe keeps operating, the natural laws work and are reliable, and we can do science. Some verses along those lines, Hebrews 1, 3, it says that, that Christ upholds the universe by the word of his power. When Paul goes to the Athenians in Acts 17, he says, in him we live and move and have our being. So you can see that is not a view of God that says God starts the world, walks away, and then maybe he reaches in and does a miracle. That's a view of God that says God is there in every moment. And the fact that I can count on the law of gravity working every single time I do an experiment is because God sustains the universe and makes it work in a predictable way so that I can do science. You can see phrasing it that way shows that God is not outside the system, the system doesn't work on its own, and God really does want me to do science. That's why it's predictable. And it gets us out of this mode of thinking of faith and science as two things that are diametrically opposed. Okay? So instead, when you, instead of just saying natural causes, like things just work on its own, as Christians, we actually believe that every time you get rain, every time there's a famine, that's still part of God's sovereign providential ordering and sustaining of the natural world. Even a simple gravity experiment like this still is, part of, is God interacting with the world. The fact that these electrons are working, God is there, and, and he doesn't just step away and let it all go on its own. See what I mean? By the way, this shows that, that we're, it's, we're, it's very easy for us to just soak in the enlightenment culture that's around us instead of trying to think biblically. Okay, a good example would be Jesus saying he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, showing that God is, is involved. Okay, now let's move on to the third topic, which is Hume and witnesses. And basically, <coughs> Hume kind of eventually got to the point where he's like, okay, okay, fine. Maybe, wit maybe miracles are technically possible, but if you got a report from somebody else that a miracle had happened, how could you ever believe them? Hume says, <clears throat> he says, if any, when anyone tells me that he saw a dead man restored to life, I immediately consider with myself whether it's more probable that this person should either deceive or be deceived, right? Either the person's lying to you or they're confused, that the fact he relates should have really happened. I weigh that one miracle against the other, and according to the superiority which I discover, I pronounce my decision and always reject the greater miracle. That means he embraces that which is most, he thinks is most probable. If the falsehood of his testimony would be more miraculous than the event, which he relates then, and not till then, can he pretend to command my belief or opinion? So basically, Hume is saying, like, if you, if you tell me a miracle happened, I think, which is more likely, that a miracle happened or that you're lying or you're confused, that you've made an error in some way or another? For any human witness, surely, surely it's more likely that I should disbelieve the witness than it is that I should believe this miracle. P error, the probability of error, is always going to be bigger than the probability of the miracle. That's the argument. <clears throat> in fact, this kind of argument even floated around in ancient times. There was this, uh, this saying in ancient Rome, uh, I would not believe such a thing even if it were told me by Cato himself. Cato was a politician who had a reputation for always being truthful and honest and reliable. I know that's hard to believe, but that's what they meant, right? And so they, they, said, they said, even if the most reliable witness out there told me, it's still too improbable, I still can't take it. Right? And Hume would say that would apply here. <clears throat> in fact, Hume used what he called the diminution view. <clears throat> Sorry, dimu dimu diminution view. And I'll, I'll explain what that means. He says, let's say you have a jar, and there's marbles in a jar, a lot of marbles in the jar. And one of the marbles, most of them are normal marbles, but one marble looks like the earth. It's a little special marble. It costs a lot of money. And then you have a witness, and you say, witness, please uh, dig your hand in the jar, dig your hand around, and pull out a marble. And tell me which one you get. So if the witness, the idea is, if the witness pulls out and says, like, oh, it's the earth marble. The question is, how, how many marbles would have to be in there before you start doubting whether that witness is telling the truth? If it was 10, 10 marbles in there, and he pulls out the earth marble, you're like, one out of 10 chance. Maybe that happens. 
But eventually the number of marbles gets so big that you don't believe it anymore. You think like, I don't know about this. I don't know about this witness. There's no way. If the number of marbles gets up to a trillion, and they say, out of a trillion marbles, I pulled out the one special one, you would think like, mm, that is so unlikely that I think it's more likely you're just confused or lying to me or you bet money on it or something like that, right? You just think, I can't believe this witness. So Hume would say, in this case, the earth marble is a miracle and all the other marbles are all the examples we have of, of uh, life working normally. So you can't believe the witness in that case. So again, he says P miracles is less than P error. So the problem with this analysis from Hume is uh, you need to open up your possibility to the fact that like, what if you have multiple independent witnesses multiple independent witnesses that didn't collude with each other, they don't have a conspiracy with each other, and they all say, like, it really is the earth marble, you'd, you'd have to be open to the possibility that it really was. The other thing is, Hume is, you can tell, but just by the nature of the analogy, Hume is saying it's random. That the witness is claiming, oh my word, I randomly pulled out the special marble out of a trillion marbles. But that actually is not what most miracle claims are. When, when someone says a miracle happened, they do not mean like of all the places and all the gen joints and all the galaxy, right? This is the one, this is the one miracle that happened to happen randomly. Again, we, we, we say that miracles have a religious context and they say they happened to this specific person at this specific time for a specific reason and it's not random. In fact, you might be tempted to say if the witness says that they pulled out the special marble, you might think, hmm. Maybe the, earth, maybe the special marble is magnetic and they like pulled it out with the magnet. So there's something defeating all these possibilities. And the witness would say like, yes, that's what I'm telling you. Something special is happening. That's what a miracle is. Okay. The point is you don't actually, in, in all those cases show that you don't actually know what the probability of a miracle is. And you actually have to do the hard work and say, do I believe this witness? Is what they're saying really credible? Are there other independent witnesses who can attest to that? And then, then you can start to gauge what's really true. All right, the last point Hume makes, and I'll end with this, is about comparative religion. And this is actually the one point where I think Hume kind of has a point, okay? So Hume says, there are lots of different religions, and they all claim miracles. All these different religions claim miracles. Any given religious person only believes in one of those religions, presumably. So why, why do you, religious person, you believe the miracle claims from your own background, but you're super skeptical all of a sudden when you hear miracle claims from these other backgrounds. Why? There's no good reason for that. There's no good reason to be super skeptical toward everyone else and super credulous toward your own background, except for prejudice. That's the only reason to do it. And so Hume would say like, well, if all these religions make mir miracle claims and all the miracle claims are about equally trustworthy, they can't all be true. Therefore, we're going to say that they're all false. So what can we answer to this? Um, one is Hume is assuming that multiple religions can't have miracles because presumably the miracle would like confirm whatever that other religion is. That's not necessarily true, right? It's not necessarily true. By the way, um, for those of you Christians who like to fight with other Christians from other denominations, this is an important point to keep in mind. I have heard many, many cases where Christians from a particular background will hear about a miracle claim among Christians of another background and they think like, oh, that can't be true. And they think that can't be true because they dislike the theology of this other Christian group. Just think, like, God may still do a miracle among a Christian group that has messed up theology. You better hope so, because you probably have some messed up theology, too. So a miracle claim doesn't automatically, like, confirm all the religious claims of whatever group experienced it. Does that make sense? So the other thing you can say to Hume is, <clears throat> uh, are you sure that there's no good reason to accept some miracle claims and not others? It seems like you're not actually doing your homework there. And that's the real answer, is if you want to compare miracle claims from Islam, from Christianity, from Mormonism, from whatever, right, from all these different backgrounds that all have different miracle claims, you actually have to do the hard work and say, are those witnesses reliable? Are those witnesses something that I can, that I can take some stock in? Are there multiple independ independent attestations, right? And a good test that the book goes through is like, do you believe or do you not believe in, <clears throat> in UFO sightings, right? There's lots of witnesses that say they've been abducted uh, uh, via UFO. So you'd have to say, well, they're not really independent. Well, these witnesses don't seem very reliable. So you, need to, you do need to nail down why are the witnesses in one case unreliable and the witnesses in this case I actually think are reliable. And that, that means that we're actually going to have to do some homework 
And I think that's where the next few weeks in Ratio Christi are going to go, especially for the big miracle claims. The biggest miracle claim of all is the resurrection. Because if you believe in that miracle, then your whole worldview changes. And so you have to actually have to say, like, what are the witness claims? What are the, 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 what's the evidence that people will give for the resurrection? Okay. I'll go ahead and summarize here. <clears throat> Hume says that miracles are violations of natural laws, and natural laws are probably, statistically, never violated. Um, <clears throat> and the, the answer I would give is that a miracle is not actually a violation of natural law, and um, that doesn't undermine our ability to do science because miracles don't happen randomly. They're not capricious, right? Um, <clears throat> Hume also says you can never believe. There's never going to be enough witnesses for you to believe something, and so you can answer like, why? That's not necessarily true. That, again, Hume is still kind of treating the probability of a miracle as very low, but you don't actually know that. There's no way to know that ahead of time. You actually have to do the hard work, engage whether you believe that witness or not. Okay? And then finally, this last one about how uh, we're all very skeptical toward miracle claims. We actually really do need to do the hard work and figure out why are you skeptical towards some miracle claims and not others. And that it means we have to work. We actually have to think. That's not something that we can skip. With that, I will stop and I will open us up for questions. Thank you. I think we may have some questions in the chat. Let me look at this. No, never mind. It's just sound check. Okay, questions. So I have a, I guess this is more of a comment. Okay. Um, I think that when you're talking about the kind of typical in, incredulous attitude towards miracles that probably most of us have. I think there is also a difference there too because it's not, it doesn't really matter to me whether a particular miracle claim outside of it, something important like the resurrection. When I hear a weird miracle claim, I, I'm, I may not believe it, but it also doesn't really matter. So of course I'm not gonna put the effort to, to investigate it. Hmm. Unless I decide that for some reason this is important to me to actually answer the question. Hmm. Um, whereas, you know, if you're going to talk about something like the resurrection, the claim at least is that it's of this is of significance to you as an individual, and you ought to, you know, care whether or not it really happens. So this is a really good point, and I'll, I'll repeat that just in case folks couldn't hear that. The idea was that. You know, I said, if you're going to gauge a particular miracle claim, you have to do the hard work to determine whether it's reliable or not. But, like, that takes effort. So how do you know if it's worth it or not? It's worth it to chase down a miracle claim if it seems plausible and it actually matters to you. And the resurrection is probably the biggest one. That one actually makes real claims upon your life, and it would, be a real cha it would, it would change your life if it turned out to be true. So that's one that commands your attention. Whereas, like, the random YouTube comment that says, I, would, I was abducted by aliens, you're like, no, and also I'm not... Not invested in that. It doesn't matter, right? I don't need to expend the energy to chase that down. Good. Other questions? So I have kind of a, 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 I don't know if this is really a question, but something that I think is kind of interesting is when you're talking about the miracle claims, um, I hear a lot of times when people say things that are either confirmatory of their faith or they call things that are miracles that are not actually like miracle miracles, like using your triad scheme. Mm -hmm. I, I know eventually you rejected that, but even even in that case, though, um, I, I, uh, like coincidences, I was, things like that? Yeah, stuff like that. I'm trying to think of a good example. I, I remember like, like my family, for example, we had a lot of conversations about this because, uh, you know, my mom would say things like uh, there was a miracle that happened or like one of her friends said something was a miracle. I'm like, that entire sequence is entirely naturally Causal. Yeah. But there's something significant about it. Like if, um, I, I think probably the most common example would be something like if somebody prays for somebody and then uh, they're helped to get better and then they do get better, but there's no like obvious right. break right. In, right, right, right. in the causal chain, if that makes sense. Yeah, it seems like, uh, so the, the comment was, it seems like people attribute miracles a lot of times to to um, this middle category that I have, the special providence category. And I guess what I would say is that middle category is probably more prone than any other to confirmation bias. So I've all heard this term, confirmation bias. I heard it, um, there was a very funny tweet about this. Usually tweets are dumb, but this partic particular tweet was, was, was very funny. And it was like a love song. It was like, why do birds suddenly appear every time you are near? Confirmation bias. 
<laughs> and the idea is like, all the times when, when my beloved is not here, I don't, I don't look for the birds. But when she's here, then I notice like, oh. And so that's the idea. Is like there's certain times where you look for evidence and other times you don't. And so when someone says like, we prayed for so-and-so, and the next day they were, they were better. They were healed. It's a miracle. It's like, you know, that's when the skeptical part of you should be like, now, did you keep track of all the times you prayed for somebody and it didn't work? And like, what would actually count? Anyway, that's a little pedantic, but that is how you get away from confirmation bias is you actually have to like say, okay, what would actually count? And it does seem, it also seems like slightly wrong to start keeping statistics on, on what percentage of your prayers are, are, are answered or those kinds of things. Cause it seems like you're testing God in that case. So anyway. I guess my, my final answer on that is watch out for confirmation bias because it's a, it'll, it'll get you. Everybody has this problem. Hmm. Quick question. So you said uh, when you have a lot of independent witnesses and whatnot for a miracle, so how many is enough? Oh, like I don't know. What do you all think? How many, how many, marble people how many, how many witnesses would you need to where you would believe a, a truly remarkable account? How many independent witnesses would you, would you need? How many do you need in a court of law? Oh, I don't know. Well, if you're a uh, ancient Israelite, I believe it's two. Two? But that's also for like, you know, a crime that happens pretty often. That's for, you know, like the death penalty. If, right. You know, you need two witnesses to that someone killed someone else for right. the death penalty. Mm -hmm. But for something that sort of seems to violate the, you know, I know you kind of talked against this, but like the natural course of events. Sure. Uh, you know, it might be plausible to have more. Or reasonable to have more than two. Don't we need uh, some Bayes theorem? <laughs> so you remember me talking about the equations that make all the book sales go down? Like Bayes theorem actually is a pretty big chunk of the book. Bayes theorem actually helps you keep track of like, what's the probability of this happening? What's the probability of me observing this thing if my original hypothesis is true versus if it's not true, things like that. Um, I thought about it, but I ultimately chose to have zero equations in my talk for similar reasons. But that's how you keep track of like how many witnesses enough. Witnesses enough is uh, well, you certainly right. you you would be skeptical if the person reporting was the only yeah. person who's saying it, right? Right. So um, some of some of the things are that way in. Uh, in some other religions, I think. Oh, one person saw it. Uh -huh. sort of there's like a, you know, there's only the person who is reporting and saying it. So that's kind of suspect. I would say that's skeptical. Right. So when we did the probability calculation a moment ago, of like we said that P miracle is kind of hard to come up with, but the P error, you actually can do some math on that front. Like what's the likelihood that one person is mistaken? What's the likelihood of two people who didn't collude with each other or get their story straight with each other, but they're both mistaken in exactly the same way? These actually are the arguments that people have in a court of law. Mm -hmm. And like the defense lawyer, if he's trying to tear down witness testimony, he'll claim like, oh, they're, the witness's testimony like doesn't actually match with each other, or maybe they knew each other and they got their story straight before they walked in the door. So that's where the, the law court uh, idea actually does make some sense. And you can imagine if you have, you know, 10 different people who didn't know each other and haven't talked to each other, and they all report the same thing, like that's when things start to become pretty, pretty reliable. And I think if the witness, if the multiple witness, you have to look at them too. Are they skeptical of it? And then they have to say, yes, I didn't even think this was. Yeah, do they have reason to believe in, it? In other or, words, yeah. they're not trying to, they're not favorable or, or have confirmation bias right. towards it. So right. they're skeptical themselves and they're saying that, you know, what right. they witnessed. So that's sort of heavier weight than someone who wants to say this happened. Right, right, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So is there any reason why we should care about any particular miracle claim, perhaps be, other than the resurrection, because that's, we've, we've already kind of discussed that. Hmm. Is there, are there other miracle claims that we should we should care about actually trying to assess whether or not they're legitimate legitimate? I mean, I'll tell you, I have enough Mormon friends that I found it worth my time to check out the Joseph Smith story and make my own assessment. 
That's an example. What do y'all think? What other miracle well, things? Well, Andrew, would you person? say, so you're saying you wouldn't need to, you wouldn't, someone doesn't need to accept all the miracles of Jesus that are recorded in the Gospels. So you could, but, but when you want to know that Jesus did miracles in his ministry prior, you know. Well, I mean, for me at least, with the resurrection, if the resurrection happened, right, then that is evidence in favor of the other claims of the Gospels. Yeah, it changes right. the problem. But I mean, you're not putting in that you're not putting those into question with that remark. No, I, it's just for me, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to do a thorough assessment of the number of witness. I, like I've never even thought of Jesus walking on water. Well. How many independent attestations? How many Gospels <laughs> yeah. is it in? I, yeah. I have to do the math on every single one. Yeah, I, I don't need yeah. to do that because I have other reasons to believe that it's true, which is yeah. less of a probabilistic argument. But I'm thinking about like, um, so I can say, um, you know, in the Catholic Church, and we have at least a couple of people here who are Catholic, right? Um, to, um, to become a, or be recognized as a saint, mm -hmm. right? Miracles is part of that, and there's actually a strong impetus to investigate those claims. Mm -hmm. If you're a Protestant, I don't see really many situations where you should really worry about it. I, you know, you hear miracle claims fairly often from from different people. A lot of things happening overseas, you know, third-hand stories about things. But you know, I tend to be super skeptical of those things. But at the same time, I don't really care to to find out that much. Yeah, I think, I think you're hearing a little bit of a difference between different Christian denominations. Protestants, historically, have been so, I don't know, I guess skeptical of any one claiming spiritual authority. They say, sola scriptura, right? Just the Bible. That's our only infallible authority. So if some, some pastor, for instance, says, I did a miracle, therefore you have to listen to whatever I say because I have revelation from God, Protestants would have reasons to say like, Theologically, we don't, we, I don't care what happened, I'm not putting that authority on you. And so they're much less likely to like, associate. This is that question of like, does the miracle confirm a particular theology or confirm a person as a messenger of God, that sort of thing. And, and Protestants, just based on their theology, are much less likely to, to ch chase something like that down. At least non-charismatic Protestants. That's right, Charis that, and that's actually the, the, the reason. If you had to say, what's the number one source of conflict between charismatic uh, uh, Christians and others, it, it often has to do not with practice, but with authority. These concerns that you may be, you may be granting authority to a, a, a person based on some sign or wonder. Yeah, the, the big quote, because I run in Calvin circles pretty often, so the big quote, I think it's from John Owen, it's like, oh, you have a revelation from God? Does it conform with the Bible? Well, then I don't need to hear it. Does it contradict with the Bible? Well, then it's wrong. So, <laughs> so I'll, I'll repeat the quote. The quote was from John Owen, and uh, the quote was, oh, you have a miracle? Well, does it conform with the Bible? If it does, then I don't, I don't need to hear it. If it doesn't conform with the Bible, then it's wrong, and I don't care about it. So extra miracles beyond Scripture are not necessary. That would be the, the argument. And, and I mean, a lot of the founders of, like, American uh, evangelicalism were all, like, cessationists anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. that's right. <coughs> I wonder if there's something, like, in terms of, I know a lot of times with, I'm not charismatic, I don't really know about the theology all that well, but I feel like part of it is at least to sort of show people, you know, to bring them faith, like if they see someone being healed in their church, then they, you know, they take that as some sort of way to bring people to Christ. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we might have to doubt that just because I kind of lost what I was saying. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. And that actually, I mean, I, I think the, 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 the best of the charismatic church is often trying to emulate what we see in the book of Acts at its best, right? And so in the book of Acts, when a miracle happened, they always use terms like signs and wonders. And so it's not just like, yay, a miracle. That was convenient. It's always like, this is a miracle. Yes, that's good that this person was healed. Good for them. But it's meant to be a sign to the rest of us uh, that, uh, that the Holy Spirit has fallen on the Gentiles and that we need to do this or to increase our faith, something. It's a sign from God of some bigger truth. Similar to how Jesus' miracles are not just like, yay, everybody had fish and bread to eat tonight. Good for us. It was to, to be a, a signifier of who Jesus was. Yeah. So another thing that came to mind when we were talking about the probability for miracles was I heard it referred to also in another place in terms of a lottery. 
so for example, if someone wins the lottery, say there's a one in 10 million chance that that happens, mm -hmm. and then their friend, after having watched the news or read the newspaper or whatever, runs up to them and says, hey, look, you just won the lottery. What's the probability that they read the winning numbers wrong? Mm -hmm. Is it greater than one in 10 million or one in 50 million or whatever the probability of them winning the lottery is? Well, if it's greater, then it would be rational for the person who won not to believe it. Right. right but right, at right. the same time, it seems like it'd be reasonable for the person to believe it because what motive does the other person have not, you know, to tell them a falsehood or, you know, right. what that is. So it's kind of interesting to view it in that light. Yeah, Hume's, Hume's view has been criticized precisely on these kind of grounds, the rare event ground. The lottery is a good one because, like, somebody's going to win the lottery. And so we'll say that everybody who, who like whoever wins the lottery in, in, your defini in, in your scenario would be, by Hume's logic, skeptical that they had actually won. But somebody has to win, you know, so, yeah. yeah, good. I mean, it's even worse than that. Like, if you roll a die five times, right, what's the probability that those five numbers would come out, right? Well, it's one in six to the fifth power, right? It's a pretty big number. And yet, in reality, the likelihood of you having misread those numbers is very small, even though that's an incredibly improbable event. So there has to be something more than just thinking, how likely is it that I misread a number, and how likely is it that this specific number came up? It's right. actually just the only probability that matters is how likely is it that you misread the number. Hmm. The, the probability of the numbers is, actually doesn't even matter. Because all combinations are equally, yeah. Unless you like kind of have some target numbers ahead of time, like if it was, yeah, you have if, you, if you have three dies and you roll six, 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 eight times in a row, like you might just start examining yourself a little bit. You know, <laughs> maybe, so, yeah. um, I guess the one question I you know, heard all the time as undergrad was, do miracles still happen today? Mm -hmm. And so, because you have the Old Testament miracles, Old Testament miracles, and you have the New Testament miracle, miracles, but then today, modern day, um, with your definition of miracles, um, seems to me that anything that makes logical sense will happen. Mm -hmm. Like it would, you know, in the sense kind of like, I can get home safely, and that's, that's a miracle. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that would convince anyone that sure. it's divine. So we, we would say like you making it home safely is like God's providence, right. but like the the biblical like miracle like you made it home safely without touching the ground, you know, something like that. Something that, strange would have that to happen. Would be very illogical. Right, and so th this kind of depends on your theological priors a little bit. Like, what's the point of a miracle? Mm -hmm. um, and so, like my answer to the enlightened folks tonight was that miracles aren't random; they don't just happen, you know, right. out of nowhere. I don't just get to fly home, you know, uh, just randomly. Like, oh, that was weird. It, miracles always have kind of a religious context, and it's usually the sign and wonder context. Um, and so that's what we would say about biblical miracles, is that God had a very clear like, agenda and reason for doing those miracles. In terms of why God doesn't do them more frequently or do them now, th to me, I almost stick that in a different question, which is the hiddenness of God. Um, and I struggle with that one, because if I were God, I would probably make myself more obvious. And I wouldn't make miracles happen more frequently. That's what I would do. So that's one of the, that's the reason the hiddenness of God is a, is a difficulty. Um, and so if you have friends who are like, why doesn't God do more miracles so that I don't have to guess, so that I don't have to be uncertain? Yeah, I feel like that goes in that, that difficult hiddenness of God bin. Yeah, Does that make sense? It could be spooky as well and like not convince them. Right. Or, yeah. And then we, we talked about that, the hiddenness of God. Right. When they're like, right, yeah. God's goal in, God's goal is to, is not necessarily to maximize the number of people who intellectually assent that he exists, you know. So, Julie, go ahead. And, you know, I mean, just talking about this thread, um, if you're talking about miracles today, mm -hmm. if they were more frequent, then the criteria would be messed up because uh, it, had, it has to be noticeably different from what normally happens. Mm -hmm. So if we had, like, tons of, you know, if they were more frequent, we wouldn't call them miracles then because they're... Yeah. I mean, do you know yeah, what I'm that's, saying? That's that's true. That's true. But I think I think Ada's point, though, that that like there's biblical frequency of miracles. I know. It would be really nice to have that. It would be nice to have that yeah. frequency of miracles in our churches, etc. 
Um, yeah, but you yeah. just have to. Th I guess uh, your normal, your criteria guess? for a religious context is what you have to fill. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, what is God doing? What is that reason for? If there were more frequent, if we had a rise in activity, right. say, um, in present day. So I guess if we still had fire coming from yeah. the sky, you know, it would be like something like, oh, there goes God again. You know, <laughs> to a person that's trying to cook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be fair, though, the Bible has a very strong selection bias. Because yeah. it's, they're not, there are very few long periods of no miracles. Consider mm -hmm. there, are, there was a period of 400 years between Genesis and Exodus where yeah. nothing, yeah. no reports, mm -hmm. presumably no miracles. Right, um, and then probably another four hundred years uh, or so between. They are kind of clustered. I mean, I think yeah. people don't realize that. Yeah, I mean, if all you go, Elijah, yeah, Jesus, yeah. Moses, yeah. Moses yeah. Elijah, yeah. Elisha. And yeah. I mean, even Jesus. in the even it's pretty much it. even the prophets, like you think about Ezekiel's miracles, it's slight premonition of events happening yeah. in Jerusalem. Yeah, and it's like him laying on his side and throwing bricks at people, and then talking about what's happening in Jerusalem. Yeah, or Isaiah, like the, one of the big things in Isaiah was, uh, uh, um, what was it, uh, Cyrus becomes the king of Persia, and kind of, like, you know, that's a, that's like the big event in uh, Isaiah, and it's a totally mundane thing from a causal uh, perspective. Uh, I did have one comment about the, the miracles that, that happened today. There is one dude who uh, has gotten a lot of attention, um, and for context, I, I came from a charismatic background, so I am highly soured against miracles. But there is one instance of a guy named uh, Sean George. He's been like, anytime this discussion comes up, he comes up at some point. Because uh, he was a dude that like 10 years ago had a heart attack, died, and then his wife prayed for him, and then he came, presumably, resuscitated after that. And what makes it interesting is like, first of all, he's a physician. And second of all, he has primary data of his heart condition all the way up to and immediately following the, uh, the heart attack. So if there's a candidate for a miracle, and frankly, I'm not totally persuaded, but if there is one, I think that's probably the best one. Sean George, that was the yeah, guy? Yeah, okay. yeah. And he's got a whole website of, and everything. And of course, he says it's a miracle. He thinks it's a miracle. Hmm. There have been like peer-reviewed philosophical debates uh, that have been published. About his incident specifically? Yeah, about how to interpret it. Because it's one of those things where like he was dead for about an hour and a half. And so people are like, is that the cutoff for how long you can be dead? You know? mm -hmm. Like, it's not like he was dead for like a day or 48 hours. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Again, I'm not persuaded. I'm not. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's just my own personal bias, really. Yeah. I don't think things like this are that uncommon. Um, Leslie, who might be in the in this Zoom, yeah, she is. had a story about one of her patients just a couple of years ago who they declared dead and he, like, sheet over the the bed like pulled out of the room into a hallway sitting for a while and then somebody was walking down the hallway and all of a sudden he like gasped and and was not dead um at that point he had brain damage and wound up he was really sick and wound up dying a few you know months later i think but the point is like that actually happens mm -hmm. like, that was something that happened you know down the street here you know a year ago, two years ago, pre-COVID. Yeah, you have a whole bunch of people that are right on the borderline, and then you have a whole bunch of people that are praying because they're on the borderline, and then confirmation bias, one and one, there you go. Hmm. So let me ask the audience, we'll, we'll, we'll do a little more biblical digging on miracles. Do y'all remember when people came to Jesus and said, miracle please, what was Jesus' response? Do you remember? He well, said no. <laughs> he said he won't get any sign except for the sign of Jonah. Yeah, he said a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, <laughs> which is pretty harsh. That's right. He said no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah, which presumably is the three days in the grave and three days back. And so, I, I don't know, we've kind of downplayed the special providence section mm -hmm. as, as being Hard, hard to detect. It can it can be in, uh, misinterpreted, right? Yeah. But actually, I find instances in my own life of special providence as even more exciting. I find I find that as exciting personally as hearing about anything about a, like actual yeah that's a, a, about an intervention. I, I feel right. like that that God ordering things like that 
is so cool, or if I, if I really think about it, that it is a case of sort of providential hand in it, you right. know, and, and you can inter and maybe, maybe it's misinterpreted a lot of times, but I feel like that that kind of turns me on more than miracle. Yeah, this is a good point, and, and from a Christian devotional point of view, it's not critical that you be able to nail down which category you're in, so to speak. It is important that you be able to say, God answers prayer and, um, and he listens and I'm going to pray. And when I see my prayers answered, I'm going to, I'm going to thank him and, and glorify him. Like, I think that practice needs to be there. I, even if you I can't don't even mean in pra about praying. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, you mean so, like just, uh, I, saw, I saw something well, happen. Well, just the ordering of the events that, I mean, not even that I pray for. Yeah. So this is just God working out his plan, I guess, in, in, an, in an intimate way that affects me, mm. that I can see that that was not, I didn't mm. orchestrate it or, you know, I don't know. So it's not really, it's sometimes not even a response to prayer. Because that can be very um, subjective. I, actually, I think something interesting that's very related to what you said that I've thought for a long time. Um, I think sometimes in, among Christians who haven't really thought much about this, there's an uncritical reliance on or expectation of miracles as a demonstration of God's providence. But in reality, if you, if you really understand what it means you know, for God to exist and God to be God— Everything that happens is explicitly chosen by God to happen, right? Even if he's not reaching in and doing that. Mm -hmm. So, so we, like, it, you know, when somebody says something's a miracle, usually what they're meaning is that they're feeling like they're being singled out as God having done something special for them. But in reality, everything that ever happens to you in your entire life, that was God's plan for you. Whether it's a miracle or whether it's a completely ordinary occurrence, it's equally chosen by God to happen for you. So you really, a miracle is no more significant than, than anything else in your life. Right. Yeah, we don't want to use the miracle category to downgrade the other two. Um, I will tell you all a couple of stories along these lines, and I think we can potentially close after that. When I was young, I would, I would have conflicts. I was the oldest, and I would have conflicts with my, my sister, who was two years younger than me. And I can always remember, you know, I'd get disciplined, and my dad would sit me down, and my dad would say kind of things like what Andrew just says, like, look, God put our family together for a reason. God gave you this sister for a reason. And I can remember being young and being like, don't blame this on God. This was the work of Satan, you know, like this kind of thing. But then, of course, as I got older, I was like, oh, I think my dad was right. And um, I'll give you an interesting model for how to think about this. And this may kind of go with what, with what Julie was talking about. Um, have y'all heard, heard of Augustine? Great early church father, Augustine. Um, when I was yeah, junior or senior in college, I read Augustine's Confessions. And for all the college students here, I would definitely recommend that you do so too. Uh, mainly for the reason that like, there's something very special about connecting with a Christian brother or sister across the centuries. You know, you read this person and you think like, you and me, bro, I totally see what you're going through. Like, there's something special about that, you know. And uh, the cool thing about the confessions is this. If a book is written in first person, if a book is written in first person, what does that mean? Yes. I did this and then I went there and then I thought about this. If a book is written in third person, what does that mean? He or she. They, yeah, he, they, they went down the street, they went to the store. I had never, ever read a book before that was written in second person. Second person would be what? You. That is how the confessions read. Augustine says you, and the you meaning God. He tells his own story, saying, Lord, then you let this happen, and then you brought this person into my life, and then you pressed my mother to pray for me, and then you let me meet. And so the whole, the whole thing is written like that. It's, so it's an autobiography written in second person because he recognizes that God orders every part of his life. And all these things he's gone through, God was in control and God loved him every step of the way. It's a very cool thing. And so reading the confessions is good, not just because like this is a great historic book and a great historic person, but because it gets you in the habit of thinking in that same sort of way and thinking, Lord, what are you doing in my life? So I'd really commend that to you. So, cool. 
All right, on that note, I think we'll close it out and we can hang out and discuss a little bit afterwards. Um, I see several people uh, attending via Zoom slash YouTube, things like that. Thank you all for attending as well. Um, appreciate it, guys.